It's Live in the Bream with host of Fox News at Night, Shannon Bream. All right, this week on Live in the Bream, we have got uh, somebody who I've had the privilege to go to his church, Passion City Church in D.C., hear him speak and give the word. Um, it was full of meat. It was challenging. Uh, he's got a book now that will allow you to get the same message and the same encouragement. We're so excited to welcome author and pastor Ben Stewart to Live in the Bream. Thank you, Shannon. It's great to be here with you. So the brand new book is Rest and War, Rhythms of a Well-Fought Life. And so a lot of people, they're going to look at that title and say, okay, what the heck does this mean? Rest and War. (laughs) Yes. Well, it is a field guide to the spiritual life is what I tell people. I just have encountered so many people that are experiencing they don't feel like they're flourishing as human beings. And uh, there's something about modern life that is not allowing us to do that. So in the safest time to live as human beings, relatively speaking in history, we feel filled with anxiety and anger and addiction and distraction. And so this book is, is an attempt to help people understand it feels like a battle spiritually because it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, And yet it's a battle in which our King has, fought the decisive victory and because he's been victorious we can too and so what does it look like if the spiritual life's a struggle how do we struggle well and Mm -hmm. so this book's about trying to figure that out the rhythms of rest and war is kind of where we're headed well i love that one of the earliest illustrations you have in the book you talk about prisoners being set free and handed a sword (laughs) so we're not set free to just be like okay now i'm just gonna lounge around and eat grapes and and sit in the hot tub i mean we're set free from um if you're a christian if you're a believer what you view as the change of uh, of sin and the oppression of that in your life it can make you totally miserable um whether it's addiction or, you know, messed up relationships, whatever you're fighting against. So you are set free from that if you accept what Christ has done for you, but it's set free to go fight. Explain that. Yeah. Well, there's a great um, story in the Old Testament, you know, when King David, uh, you know, the nation of Israel, the Philistines had encroached, attacking on their territory. The Israelites were cowering in fear until David stepped out fights Goliath on their behalf. And when they watch him victorious, they shout the war cry and drive the Philistines out of their land. And for me, spiritually, I think it's the same for us. When we see Jesus, the son of David fight for us uh, on the cross, that's what he's doing spiritually. It frees us up to go, you know, I can drive fear and lust and pride out of my life. But I find many people experience that when they come to faith or pursue God. They just thought, man, I just thought some of these addictions would go away. I thought some of these temptations would, and they're so discouraged by the struggle. And that's where those lines came from. You were talking about saying, no, you've been set free, but set free for the fight, not from the fight. I mean, before you were just a victim. Now you have a chance to be a victor and C.S. Lewis said it. um, Christianity is the story of the true King has come and he is inviting us all to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. And that's what it is. It's people who are being equipped to struggle well. The penalty of sin is gone. There's no condemnation, but there's a process now of breaking the power of that canceled sin in our lives. And, and there's strategies we can employ and uh, there's ground to be gained. And I, for me, that's an encouraging thought. Mm-hmm. I'm not doomed by my struggles. I, I can have progress in the struggle. Right. And the struggle actually means you are making progress. Um, I, I've got the book all marked up and I just, I have this one part I want to read that I have, that I start. It says the spiritually dead do not struggle with sin. Your struggles far from being a sign of your spiritual death are in fact, just the opposite. Your struggle may be one of your greatest assurances that you are alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think if you're spiritually dead, you're not aware of that there's a spiritual battle in the world externally and internally, but uh, I talk to so many people that the fact that they just keep struggling with some addiction or discouragement, they go, man, I wonder if God really loves me. I wonder if he really cares. You're like, Hey, the fact that you're struggling, the fact that you want to move forward, that's a sign he's working in you. You may have some bad strategies you're deploying, but, but this is a fact that you're alive. Now we just got to figure out how to struggle well. But I think for many of them, the encouragement will come with knowing I mean, the best fighters are the people who know they've been fought for that. Hey, God fought for me. Jesus loves me. He's not shaming me. And for so many people I've encountered, shame keeps them from strategizing. Mm -hmm. And once you can get that shame out of the way, no, I'm loved. Then you go, oh, okay. Then 
let me come up with a strategy of how I can walk out by the power of God from some of these besetting sins and discouragements into a life of persistent, though imperfect progress. And uh, I think the struggle is, yeah, a sign you're alive. Now let's just figure out how to struggle well. Let's not beat ourselves up, but let's beat up some sin in our life. Mm -hmm. I'm talking with author and pastor Ben Stewart. The book is Rest and War, Rhythms of a Well-Fought Life. Um, You talk about knowing that you've been fought for and what you believe is so important as you move forward. Another line from the book, we need to charge forward with our new identity and mission. So how does that equip us to get into the fray? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I remember reading a book a long time ago about Spartans and why they were so victorious in battle. And there's much to not emulate in the Spartan culture. But one of the reasons they fought so bravely is their king didn't hang in the back. Their king went first. And when they watched him risk his life for them, they were like, we're going with that guy. If he, if he's willing to risk his life for us, then we're running out with him. And for the Christian, I think it's, it's enormously settling internally to see, man, Jesus fought for me, that he loves me. And once I realize that, that I'm valued, then I'm not fighting for acceptance. I'm fighting from it. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, if we look at what motivates us to do what we do, say what we say, it's that I'm desperate for acceptance. But if I can realize, no, you have that, there's a peace that settles in. And I think it's fascinating, you know, in the book of James, when he's talking to us about how temptation works in our life, he's talking about kind of how to avoid it in certain ways. But then he says, don't be deceived. He says up upstream from every addiction and temptation is deception. And what's the deception? He says, don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes down from your father above. He's, he's saying the lie that, that launches all these sins in our lives, the lie that God's not a good dad. He doesn't care for you. He doesn't love you. That's where it started in Genesis. If the serpent can convince Eve that God doesn't have her best interest in heart, then she will go to many deceptive streams looking for life. And so it's important to start the fight there. I know I'm loved because uh, the things of earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We got to look at him if we want hope. Yeah, that's such a great shift in perception. You're not fighting for acceptance, you're fighting from acceptance. I feel like if we could really get that in our bones, it would change the way that we strive, that we view relationships, that we view our place in the world, what we're after, and looking for um, just something to validate us when we've already been validated by the greatest um, being to ever exist, if you are a person of you know faith. Um, one of the first things you did was say, write out 1 Timothy 4.16. So I actually wrote it in the margins of the book right there. So okay. I have it. It says, watch your life and doctrine closely persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What's that about? Yeah, I love it because it's the Apostle Paul talking to young Timothy, and he's saying, be a student of your doctrine. Know what you believe, Timothy. Like, learn about the God who made you and how the world works. But then he says, be a student of you. Like, watch yourself. You, You are in charge of guiding your own life. So be a student of you and watch. Um if we all struggle, how does it get you? What what are the particular tactics the enemy deploys to discourage you, dishearten you? What are things you need to do to come alive? And so I I think there's a freedom. If you can get past the shame in life to just go, no, let me strategize. We'll be a student of you and go, all right, if all of us are tempted, where does the enemy get me? What lies do I believe? Mm -hmm. Um, what sad, broken places do I go to escape intolerable feelings? (laughs) Well, okay. (laughs) If, What's the path that leads me there? How do I walk back off off that path? How do I back away from the insanity and make different choices? And uh, I think it starts by being a good student of yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you talk in that next section to really look and resist your first impulses. If you've figured out that they're going to lead you to a tough place Um, and really being able to backtrack from that horrible hole that you end up in sometimes with what got you there, because it isn't just like you look up one day and say, I want my life to be miserable and um, controlled by something that is destructive to me or to my family or to people that I love. Um, You say it's easier to resist the river of temptation when it's a tiny stream, not a raging waterfall. Yeah. You got to keep way ahead of temptation. And obviously you talk about how the enemy, you know, knows what your weak points are going to look for them. So we got to know them for ourselves and make decisions 10 steps before we get there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, you mentioned it. Um, we were talking earlier about even the pandemic, you know, when it started for me, I thought like every good leader, I need to research and figure out all the data and discern the best thing. So first thing in the morning, I'm reading every article and every, and then I just realized why am I anxious all the time? Why am I <laughs> short with my children? Why is suddenly everyone stupid and stressing me out? And I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Just if I don't like the outcomes, let me analyze the inputs. Let me be a student of me and going, starting with chaos first thing in the morning does not produce good outcomes in the life of Ben. So I can beat myself up or take it out on people or I go, mm, let me switch strategies. 